Aftermath in Hiroshima, From Devastation to Testament of Human Resilience On August 6, 1945, at precisely 8.15 local time, an American B-29 dropped the world's first uranium atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Japan, obliterating it and instantly killing an estimated 80,000 Japanese citizens. The co-pilot of the Enola Gay stared in awe out the plane's window and later wrote, My God, what have we done? Using the atomic bombs, the Americans ended the war but unleashed immense suffering on the Japanese people. From the ashes of Hiroshima, a city symbolizing world peace was born. In this lecture, you will learn how even decisions that result in tragedy or shocking events can drive a community's collective memory narrative and propel social, political, and memorialization movements. Hiroshima's resilient citizens survived the bomb and went on to become active participants in the global nuclear disarmament movement. By exploring their story, you'll be better able to consider and contrast how other cities and countries respond to crisis. Little Boy exploded at 2,000 feet above Shima Hospital, the initial blinding flash followed by temperatures of 5,400 degrees Fahrenheit at the blast epicenter. In a moment, the bomb carbonized anyone within a mile radius. Thousands of charred bodies filled the streets and rivers, and the smell of death was everywhere. The city was unrecognizable, with almost 90% of its buildings destroyed, trapping thousands of moaning citizens in the rubble. Black rain fell and added to the misery by drenching the survivors with radiation. Symptoms of radiation poisoning quickly appeared and often led to death. In the coming years, the radiation's long-term effects included spiking rates of leukemia, cancer, and congenital disabilities. In 1954, Japanese citizens erupted in outrage after the Americans exposed a Japanese fishing boat crew to hydrogen bomb fallout after a test in the Bikini Atoll. The event triggered a Japanese anti-nuclear movement and shed new light on Hiroshima survivors. Under the Cold War shadow, angry citizens pressed a reluctant government to provide relief for bombing victims and protect future Japanese citizens exposed to radiation. Years later, thousands of Americans suffered debilitating and deadly health effects when the World Trade Center collapsed after the terrorist attack on September 11, 2001. As in Hiroshima, those exposed to toxins continued to develop cancer at a much higher rate than the general population. As in Japan, the American government dragged its heels to respond. Victims successfully pressured Congress to extend the September 11th Victims' Compensation Fund through 2090 as the long-range exposure effects remained unknown. Directly after the atomic bombings, the United States government presented a message to its citizens that was abstract, clinically scientific, removed from human suffering, and intended to retain support for the bombs. For many Americans, the U.S. Army image of the plane turning away from the billowing mushroom cloud was the end of the story. Of course, this viewpoint was problematic and untenable once visual and written proof of the bomb's horrible power emerged. It dawned on people that if one plane and one bomb was capable of decimating an entire city, the technology behind it could destroy the human race. Worldwide, Hiroshima and Nagasaki's devastation acted as a deterrent for warring nations to refrain from using nuclear weapons. Despite their supposed commitment to democratic values, the American occupation force exercised broad censorship over the atomic bomb narrative in Japan, limiting access to foreign journalists, confiscating film footage and articles, and suppressing radiation illness details. However, the destruction and loss of life were central to the Japanese experience, and due to the censorship efforts, the onus went to the survivors to bear witness. And who were the survivors? The legal definition of those who experienced atomic bomb injuries and radiation exposure became known as the hibakusha, or those who were bombed. Hibakusha had to prove their bombing experience fell under at least one of the four specified criteria to receive state-sponsored medical assistance benefits under the 1957 medical law. The Hibakusha were not only traumatized by the bombs and subsequent fires, but found themselves targets of discrimination. Japanese citizens incorrectly believed that the bomb released a deadly and contagious virus. Their fears solidified as masses of people fell ill and died in the weeks following the blast. 
Many hibakusha were turned away from their homes, shunned from marriage, and even refused food. Despite their difficulties, the hibakusha rebuilt their lives and found purpose as vocal peace movement proponents and leaders, and in the ensuing years, felt compelled to record their stories. Because the world bore witness to Hiroshima being the first city destroyed by atomic weapons, both Japanese and international stakeholders provided an impetus toward rebuilding it as a symbol of the consequences of nuclear weapons. After receiving the American Occupying Forces permission and funds, Japanese local and state governments agreed to construct the city with resilience and peace as its central narrative. The Hiroshima Prefectural Industrial Promotion Hall remnants were near the bomb's epicenter and stood out amongst the rubble. Although preserving the structure was a contested issue, it was ultimately retained as part of Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park and Museum that opened in 1954. From 1946 until today, the dome serves as the backdrop for the annual Peace Festival. Similar to the remnants of the preserved nuclear dome, the 9-11 Museum and Memorial's Foundation Hall includes walls that survived the initial attack and the tower's collapse. The physical structures in both the Hiroshima and New York memorials and museums impart resilience narratives that show visitors that human beings are capable of not only bouncing back from destruction, but re-emerging more vigorous than ever. However, both memorials are not without conflict. The Peace Park and Museum exhibits emphasize Japanese victimhood and make no corresponding mention of the context for the atomic bombs as the final act in a war due in large part to Japanese aggression. This omission is really problematic because the Japanese create a dissonant and untruthful national war memory when they refuse to take responsibility for their World War II atrocities. In New York, some victims' families are dismayed that unidentified human remains are stored in the same building as the museum. Additionally, a group of clergy leaders expressed grave concern about the museum's failure to differentiate adequately between terrorism and Islam. The Japanese chose peace after being bombed, and the resulting examples of Hiroshima and Nagasaki successfully deterred warring nations from unleashing atomic weapons again. The Hibakusha testimonies and resilience provide an example of how to live courageous lives. Their voices have been influential for decades, pressuring governments worldwide regarding nuclear weapons and power plant abolition policy. New Yorkers held strong after the Twin Towers fell, vowing to rebuild the area to honor the dead and display their resilience to the world. However, our government chose to seek revenge and declared war in Afghanistan as the immediate response to the 9-11 terrorist attacks, a war that remains ongoing. We unleashed the atomic age and witnessed the resulting human misery in Japan. As students interested in history and policy, you should ponder why since World War II, America has repeatedly chosen aggression instead of measured responses with our actions in the world. Are we ignoring our own history? While the degrees of devastation in Hiroshima and New York are incomparable, both events created a collective memory and spurred social, political, and memorialization movements. One government chose peace, the other war. As you think about war-torn cities in the world today, what narrative for rebuilding will they choose when peace finally arrives? In 1965, O.A. Kenzo said, if the forces for peace do not win, then it will be clear that we failed to learn the bitter lessons of that tragic experience, and that failure would be a betrayal of those people who somehow maintain their human dignity amidst the most dreadful conditions ever suffered by humankind.